So um, we're at the point of our um, presentation now. We get to talk uh, with the panel, which is really exciting. Tonight we have uh, Commander Thomas uh, Sampson. He's the CIO at F-35, um, doing a lot in uh, DevSecOps. Uh, Ron Ross, fellow at NIST, and Zach Kramer, uh, a partner group uh, PM manager, we like long titles, at Microsoft Azure Government. With that, um, I have uh, given a, a little introduction, but I'd like to start this evening with uh, yourself, with each of the speakers telling us a little bit about themselves, but more specifically what they're doing in DevSecOps and uh, cloud in, in the government space today. So. With that, um, Commander uh, Sampson, perhaps you can kick it off tonight. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. It's a, it's a fun opportunity to be able to come and talk uh, with having uh, such great people on the panel and, and uh, great demonstrations of the capabilities that are out there that DOD can take advantage of. In the F-35 program, uh, the, the Joint Strike Fighter being a fifth generation aircraft is basically a, a, a whole bunch of software code wrapped around a really big engine moving very fast. And in order to make that code work with all of the, uh, the components of the air system, make it uh, operable and interoperable with other aircraft and other systems in the war space, and be able to produce and provide the aircraft and the capability at a speed that keeps pace of uh, the threats and our peer and near-peer competitors, uh, we've delved into the DevSecOps uh, arena, developing a DevSecOps environment for air system development. And we also took a look across the program in order to make that DevSecOps environment available to our, uh, our main vendors and our partners who develop the air system software, as well as government uh, depot, software depots who are doing development on the air system software with the intent that this single environment and the single DevSecOps capability with the tools and the pipeline that are available can be made available to the different development entities and everybody will be able to commit to the same, uh, the same air system code base. So it's very sweeping. Most organizations pick a program or pick an application that they're going to dip their toes in and see how it works. Uh, in on our side, we kind of went the complete opposite direction. So we're going to do everything all at once. So it's been it's been a pretty big undertaking. It's amazing. We'll look forward to digging into that a little uh, further. Um, uh, Ron Ross, would you like to tell us a little bit what uh, you're doing um, in DevSecOps today? Uh, thanks, Karina. I uh, really appreciate uh, all of the uh, contributions from industry tonight. It's just fascinating to see how fast they're moving and, and what kind of great accomplishments they're they're uh, bringing to uh, to the security space. Uh, as most of you know, I spent the last 15 or so years uh, in the FISMA program, uh, building the risk management framework and all the security controls. And of course, I heard several references tonight to the authorizations to operate the ATOs. And now we're moving into continuous authorization, continuous monitoring. To say that uh, I'll be moving to Dev DevSecOps very soon after we get the final version of 853 Rev 5 on the street, hopefully fairly soon. But I think this is, uh, to me, DevSecOps uh, is, it might be the most important thing that's happened to security in the past 40 years. One of the difficulties we've had with all of our frameworks, whether it's the risk management framework or the cybersecurity framework, any framework operates at the 30,000 foot level. So I, I use the analogy of the water line. We know a lot about what's going on above the water line, which is where enterprises operate, but when it comes to below the water line, going deep into the system stack, and you've heard a lot about that tonight with containers and all the things that happen with the software and the firmware and the hardware coming together for capability, we absolutely do not have enough visibility into that world. I call that the black box. You know, we, we love the functionality of the black box, but we have to not only know that the appropriate security features have been implemented in these products and systems and services, but we also need to have some level of assurance and trustworthiness that those features are going to operate uh, when they need to operate and not fail uh, at an opportune time. So, we talk about DevSecOps. Uh, I, I love where the DevSecOps, the Sec is right in the middle, right in the development life cycle. We're pushing it left, 
We're doing it all the way through the life cycle. And the most important thing is that we're doing it at the speed of commercial industry. That is really the key. We can't rely on security uh, to take months and years. We have to be able to operate in the same speed of agility that industry is producing this great technology. That's critical to the warfighters. It's critical to our federal agencies and all the things they're doing in the different critical infrastructures. And it's critical to everything that we're doing today that makes a difference. So uh, I'm really happy that we're starting to uh, try to look at the specifics of what industry is doing in DevSecOps, to build a framework that will try to capture those best practices and then normalize that discussion so we can actually, as somebody said earlier, change the culture that we have to change in order to make this thing work and be institutionalized across not only the, the federal government, but across the private sector as well. Back over to you. Yeah, great. Thank you, Zach. Zach Kramer. Uh, yes, hi, everybody. So my name is Zach Kramer. I am responsible for our various Azure government platforms. So as we look across different uh, data classification levels and, and pieces like that, I I'm responsible for bring, you know bringing those platforms to market, uh, how we think about those platforms and in the environment. And one of the things that we have looked at as we look at the DevSecOps stuff in particular is on two sides of the coin. So one is in bringing a platform like that to market. It is obviously critical to meet the security standards that we need to to be trusted with that uh, data. And so we've spent a long time working with both uh, FedRAMP, with DOD, and with other accrediting officials on how we can build continuous authorizations into our pipeline, how we are able to bring on uh, assets very quickly and expand the scope of these authorizations. And so we've done a lot of great work through that partnership to be able to bring innovation faster to customers. So that's step one, is having a platform that is secure and compliant that can run. And then Step two uh, is really a question of how does all of that investment and all of those things that we've done enable mission partners like Commander Sampson to be able to get innovation back in the hands of those who need it faster? And so, um, kind of something about a, you know, a, not quite a year ago, uh, where someone was saying, like, you know, none of this matters if innovation doesn't accelerate, right? And that really kind of hit home for me on how am I thinking about. Uh, the work that my team is investing in. And so we've actually repivoted a large portion of our team uh, over to making sure that we can build the right pipelines uh, and the right capabilities into the platform to not do our own DevSecOps or anything like that, but to accelerate the patterns that are out there in the market that are enabling customers to do more. So that means things like, how do I deliver a zero trust architecture blueprint that enables you to stand up your Red Hat OpenShift container that is hardened and integrates in with the ecosystem? How do we support uh, making compliance and integrations faster? How do we support that security and monitoring so we can bring our best of breed tools partnered with other industry, you know, other partners and third parties and really enable this vision to go faster by having hardened secured infrastructure that comes out of the box, uh, leveraging the patterns of DevSecOps. So not only removing the infrastructure problems, uh, not only removing the security problems, but we're really enabling that full pipeline to work together. And so that's really where we have pivoted a large portion of our engineering team as we go forward is to delivering that infrastructure and capability, all with that goal of how do we get innovation through the pipeline and out into the field faster. Thanks, Green. Great, really great. So when we're, um, if we take a step back a little bit and think about, you know, I think this group, we're, we're really thinking about uh, commercial innovation, how to bring DevSecOps to government. Um, Fatara's scorecard right now shows positive trends in the number of software projects uh, that de we're de uh, delivering, uh, the US government, federal government. Um, so we're seeing new functionality um, being released every six months, uh, upward trend. Uh, where do you think everyone is in adopting DevSecOps as they move to cloud? Um, I don't know, uh, Commander Sampson, do you want to take that? Uh, in adopting DevSecOps and moving to the cloud, it really depends on the sector and the purpose. Uh, when we talk about weapon systems and the development of air system, weapon system, missile systems in DOD, uh, everybody wants to move to DevSecOps as quickly as possible, and everybody wants to get to those benefits of the, the uh, faster deployment times, the continuous ATO, the reduction in back-end testing that would need to be done. But on the other side of it, 
there's a, an enormous front end investment and development that needs to be put in place in order to get to the point where you can prove and attain a continuous ATO and you can have the capabilities uh, instantiated within the environment and available for the developers to use. Uh, so from the weapon system side and, and working with other uh, other programs that are going down the DoD DevSecOps framework path with Nick Shalon's team, uh, a lot of them are making very good progress. There's only a few that have actually attained that, that coveted gold gold coin of the, the continuous ATO, and those that have done it have been uh, putting out capability at monstrous rates, and they've really been able to um, take advantage of of the capability and speed of development and deployment. Kessel Run is, a, is probably the best example. Mm -hmm. Space Camp is doing great things. So those those entities who have been able to go all in and have had progressive support from the uh, from their leadership as well as from the security side have been able to achieve a really great progress. On the other side, the other two are still in the process of uh, implementing their capabilities and having that that security support understanding. I'm really excited that Ron is here for that um, to, to know that NIST is working through what what how we can codify attaining that continuous ATO and, and how we can uh, better prepare our teammates on the security side to understand what the DevSecOps uh, really means and how it works to our benefit to improve our visibility in that security posture. I think you touched on something that was asked earlier in today's um, meetup, which was uh, about that business case. And you mentioned uh, Kessel Run. Ha have we seen like an establishment of that um, kind of a baseline or that business uh, value that we're seeing in that acceleration of new capabilities? Um, are we seeing initial numbers? Uh, so the, the hard part of the business case and the business value really depends on uh, the stakeholders that you're uh, that you're presenting the business case to. Because it's when we look at something as sweeping as DevSecOps, your stakeholders include the, the developers, your security, your leadership, and, and uh, your resource providers, uh, the vendors who are providing the support capabilities to you, and each one of them have their own desirements out of the process. DevSecOps can can make things go faster, provide that continuous ATO, shorten your testing cycles, provide development more frequently, and, and give you an overall cost savings in the out years. So there are so many different business cases that you can touch on that really you have to uh, understand your audience from, uh, from our resource sponsors who are, are providing the goal for the development of the aircraft, it really turns into, well, what is the ROI and at what point in the out years are we going to be able to re realize the savings of having a common environment? From our security team, it's what is, at, at what point can I see and can I have the confidence that we're able to understand where the vulnerabilities are and, and how the vulnerabilities are being mitigated through the process? And then from the, the testing and the resourcing on the back end, it's a matter of how do we include this into our airworthiness processes from, from the aviation side, but how do we how do we reduce the need for testing on the back end in order to realize the value of putting that DevSecOps in place? And the other hard part that I know is this is new for everyone. And legacy software development, we have a lot of people who have been doing software for a lot of years and they've been doing waterfall work and providing capability. And when they need to provide capability, they do waterfall faster. And DevSecOps is, is doing it smarter, not harder. So there's a, a big learning curve for the recipients of the information to understand what is that benefit and how do we take advantage of it. Great. That's awesome. Um, Ron, um, at NIST, uh, what are you seeing as the major trends? And as you move from uh, the cybersecurity framework, which uh, I think that's what you're focused on right now, to the DevSecOps framework. Um, what what um, does that m mean for you and uh, the impact of overall adoption? Well, look, I think all these tools um, have their place. The risk management framework, the cybersecurity framework, like I said, they, they all have their place. They operate at a certain level of granularity, up 30,000 feet, but Andrew uh, Sampson was saying, when, when you want to understand what you actually have under the hood, 
within these systems. You can't add security on at the end of the life cycle. So it's not a question of return on investment for DevSecOps. This is going to be something we're going to have to do. You have to build security into these advanced systems in order uh, so, so you can understand how they are going to be protected when you get into combat operations or any other high-stress environment. We just don't have that information when you have the risk management framework and the cybersecurity framework operating at that level, that high level of generality. You've got to be able to understand what security is built in and then be able to have through the testing and evaluation that uh, Commander mentioned early and throughout the life cycle to produce that body of evidence that can give those senior leaders who are doing uh, the ATOs the very information so they can make a credible risk-based decision. So. I don't think this is a question of either or or developing an ROI. This is something that we have to do. We have to get, we've got to understand uh, that really we're doing three things, moving at the speed of industry so our, our war fighters and everybody else in the federal government and the private sector can have the latest and greatest technology. We have to be able to protect what we build. And lastly, but uh, maybe the most important, we have to be able to trust what we deploy. And if we can do those three things, we're always going to win. If we can't do those three things, it's not going to be a good outcome. Do you foresee um, any new policy or uh, standards or guidance to um, uh, help that uh, change in, in our market in adopting DevSecOps? Yeah, I would love to. We, we wrote a, a publication about four years ago. It's NIST 800-160. It's our, our first system security engineering publication. It, it goes throughout the every detail of the life cycle. The problem with that is now you have to overlay that on a DevSecOps or Agile environment. So we're going to try to do that. There is an OMB policy right now. I think it's M1903 that requires the 800-160 engineering approach for all high value assets. But what we would like to do at NIST is to develop the DevSecOps framework, which would capture these best practices that we've been discussing tonight and to make a, give some top cover to the people in the federal government who may be hesitant to move into that world. And if we can do that, then it's a win-win. It's a great win for the federal government. We'll be getting better product uh, at a faster pace, the best technology in the world and the best security. It'll be a big win for industry because they're the engine that makes all this work. So that's the focus of the next year, and we're going to be pushing really hard to try to get that done. That's awesome. And, and Zach, I know as a product engineering leader at Microsoft, you're focused on Azure for government. Uh, can you tell us a little bit what you're hoping to solve in DevSecOps for government? Uh, yeah, so one of the things, and um, uh, Commander Sampson really hit on this, is that um, we, as we look at standing this up, the holy grail is the continuous authorization. The The problem that people have run into as we've looked at this, uh, uh, as we looked at this market, is that getting that stood up, getting that infrastructure stood up, and getting that pipeline stood up takes a long time and is non-trivial, even with the great foundational work that has been laid. And so what we've been doing is looking across Azure to say, number one, how are we best supporting these pipelines, and how are we enabling these with partners like Anchor um, to be uh, fully integrated and delivered? And what we've done is come up with a backlog of features um, across the board that look at how are our DevOps tooling, how are the security integrations working, and how is all of this happening so that we have an end-to-end -end customer journey that goes through? And then how does that integrate with partners like CloudFit who are building and bringing uh, a lot of the know-how at scale across the department and other places. And so as we're able to raise the bar on the platform, enable more capability that allows you to, at the push of the button, stand up a pipeline, work with a partner like CloudFit to tune the pipeline to your needs quickly. And now you're up and running with a foundation that is repeatable, well-defined and understood that can be scaled out as you go and delivered at cloud scale uh, going forward. And this, pattern of enabling consistent infrastructure, enabling uh, pluggable patterns, and then making sure that that is documented and well understood by the security officials gives us, you know, builds on the policy work that Ron is talking about and delivers that, that goal of continuous um, authorization and that delivery of a platform. And we think fundamentally having these clouds in places where they didn't exist before, accessible uh, 
to the DOD at, at authorization levels that were not previously available fundamentally changes the calculation and makes some of these uh, DevSecOps patterns even more powerful. And then the final thing I'll say that we've really been looking at is how do you then bring all of this to the edge? So the, not everything exists within the reach of a cloud data center. I mean, we have data centers all over the place, but you know, we are not the end of it. And you, there are needs and things need to work in both disparate, limited connection, um, and different things like that. And so by having the ability to now bring those down to things like an Azure stack, I can now say, not only do I have a pipeline in the cloud that's easy, that's configurable, and that can be authorized for continuous uh, authorization, I can also do that in an edge appliance and have a consistent development experience. I can run containers at the edge and do those things. And so by making sure that you have DevSecOps wherever you need to be across a hyperscale platform or an edge platform, we believe fundamentally changes the calculation and changes the way that people think about how they can deliver innovation and what is even possible. That's great. Um, Commander Sampson, I'm very interested. Uh, we always in almost any transformation talk, talk about culture as one of the biggest challenges. Um, we've talked a lot about tonight about shifting security to the left. Um, and we understand as, as developers and operation folks and, and security folks all get together. Um, you know, how, how are they working together in, in at F35? And what have you done to facilitate that culture change? We've, uh, we've made a very concerted effort to uh, elevate our security teams and our security professionals in the program uh, for visibility and inclusion in the, in the different efforts that we have going on. With DevSecOps and cloud capabilities at, at a larger level, there has been uh, an enormous amount of education and support. Partners like CloudFit coming in and being able to work directly with our SCAs and our ISOs and our ISOs to help them understand what the capability is and how it relates to what they understand. I, I made mention that um, earlier we have we have a lot of individuals who have been doing very good work for a very long time, and within just the past year and a half, DevSecOps has taken DoD by storm. And in a year and a half, to get all of our security people to understand and be able to to navigate what DevSecOps means. And it's not just security people, our developers and as well as our program managers and our product owners. There is uh, a, an enormous amount of communication that has to happen. There's an enormous amount of explanation that has to happen, an enormous amount of recognition of all the work that's been done to get us to where we are today. And how does DevSecOps fit in the realm of where we are today in terms of all the work that's been done? Um, Ron made mention of, of the body of evidence has to be there in order for our professionals to understand and have the confidence to uh, accredit and support the pipeline. Uh, we have we have a large portion of our workforce who have focused their time and have been in a situation where they had to wait until the end to get all the body of evidence um, after the fact. Well, now it's a matter of security professionals are included at the beginning and they help make the body of evidence. They're there when the body of evidence is created and they start to understand the tools, the automation that they can draw from and get near real time, for better, or lack of a better term, real time access to the body of evidence as it grows and as it's created with an understanding of where it comes from. Because that, uh, that, that's one thing that we need to recognize in, in government software, DOD software development is the speed at which all of this happens. Uh, I was I was at the talk that Nick gave at EAU almost two years ago now, where he presented the DOD DevSecOps framework, and this is the new way of doing things. And here we are, two years later, people have thrown tons of money at it, jumped in two feet, and they're moving they're moving very quickly to get a hold of it. And and Ron Ron made mention the best technology at the fastest pace with the best security that we can get. In the past 15 years, we went from waterfall to agile to DevOps to DevSecOps, and Five years from now, this is going to be old hat, and this is going to be just yeah. the way we do things. So we as an organization have to be able to internalize that, and we need to support our people so that they can learn and, and they have the opportunity to internalize it. So uh, I'll just ask an obvious question. Are you the champion then of DevSecOps for uh, F35? Would you say that, that you were the champion of this change? 
I'm, I'm a champion for all of our people that are doing great work for all the things that are happening uh, in the office of the CIO. We are very fortunate that our leadership, uh, the program executive officer, Lieutenant General Fick, and our executive director, Ms. Skeen, are very forward leaning and looking at the future of where software development and aircraft development is going. Um, they have been out in the forefront to say these are the things that we need to do. The Chief of Staff of the Air Force has stated that DevSecOps and implementing a DevSecOps environment for development of the air system with our partners Lockheed Martin, Pratt & Whitney, BAE is essential for us to be able to keep pace with our peer competitors. So we have a lot of, of leadership and championship of the capabilities within the program. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have great teams that are doing the work and, as well as great partners in, in Microsoft and CloudFit and all of the other uh, capability and, and product uh, providers that make up that entire pipeline and environment. Um, I asked that question because um, I would say in the federal government or DOD, you know, who is that typical champion for the type change? The, the champion for the type of change in, in DOD as a whole, we've, we've gotten a lot of support and a lot of leadership from the secretary level, the Dr. Ropes, Ropers and the, the Secretary Gertz and the individuals who see the future in the way that things need to be done. When we get down to a program level at the CISCOM level, it, it tends to be the uh, digital officers. Before he retired, Mr. Malaz at Naval Air Systems Command uh, was the, the chief digital officer of the Naval Digital Office, and he championed the use and development of, of DevSecOps for Nav Air. And uh, in the, at the OSD level, we have, we're very, uh, we have very close proximity to the secretaries who champion for us. And I think in every program there at the senior leadership in the CIO office, being able to support and champion the technology implementation insertion with a, a solid team to understand what the technology is in order to provide that and, and communicate it to leadership for resource sponsorship, as well as to overcome the, the hurdles that, that hit us at every point. Great. And um, being mindful of time, I mean, this has been a great conversation. We've got three minutes. Um, uh, I guess we, you know, I had a lot of other questions and we kind of laughed, chuckled that I had 11 questions or 10 questions for the panel, given um, our time frame. But uh, I, I want to ask one question um, for all the panelists uh, before we uh, move to some of the, the questions um, from our attendees. Um, given your experience, what's one piece of advice you would give those starting out their DevSecOps uh, journey? So, uh, Zach, perhaps you can kick that one off. I mean, I think the biggest thing, and we, we talked about this a little bit before, is to kind of get started on the journey, right? Like, there's no time like the present to step out and do it. And um, it's going to be learning, it's going to be iterative. And I think using, following things like what the Air Force has done, um, what other places in industry have done uh, will help them learn, uh, but ultimately, you know, iterate and continue to drive would be my advice. Great, uh, Ron? Well, I would just say, um, don't be afraid to innovate, take some risks, jump in and, uh, don't try to, you know, boil the whole ocean. Just take a small space and show how the DevSecOps process can show the vision and the execution path to success. And that small success will will build uh, into larger successes. And I just say, don't wait around. Jump in and be afraid. Don't be afraid to take some risks. This is really, really important for. Right. And then Commander Sampson. Yeah, I think the well, as Zach and Ron really hit on it, it's uh, it's go big or go home. It, you, we're no longer going to be able to do it the old way of software development. Anybody who does is going to pro start providing products that aren't keeping pace with the needs of our warfighters. So select something, figure out what is the best, best place that you can achieve uh, attainable goals and just get started. There's a with with what Nick Shalon and uh, the DOD framework and the different camps that have been stood up there. Platform One is something that you can get into and with partners that have the experience of doing this in the commercial world as well as working with the DOD DevSecOps framework, 
there's there's more than enough capability that you can you can break off a piece that's affordable and doable for you and using it in a, an area or a piece of software that will provide you a gain in the near term. Great. Uh, with that, uh, we're just about time, but I'll take just two questions. So uh, one is, uh, do you or any, um, does anyone on this meeting know if DISA is going to adopt um, OSCAL or um, in, for automating assessments? And what are the plans for OSCAL in general? I think that was for Ron. Well, we're moving forward with OSCAL. Um, I don't know what, I can't speak for DISA, so I really can't answer that. But we are committed to uh, moving forward with uh, OSCAL. Yeah, and I'll just echo on our side from the Azure side. We've actually been moving our SSPs and other things like that to partner and leverage the OSCAL format and be able to push into it. So we are certainly supporting that and have been, you know, again, working with DISA and EMAS and things like that on ways to partner. But yeah, I can't speak for DISA right now either. Okay, with that, I want to thank all the speakers today uh for uh participating in the panel and this great discussion i know there'll be a lot of follow-up questions um with uh this community and we invite you to participate again as we continue this dialogue around devsecops and we will follow your journey in innovation and government uh so thank you uh very much for that um and uh we will be posting this live chat on on youtube so please uh, check us out there if you want to uh, uh, check out this uh, video or any of the meetup uh, videos uh, moving forward. And then I also want to thank all the participants. Again, we have about 300 people register and uh, over 150 attending tonight. So we're really, um, you know, blessed to have everybody um, that uh, blessed that we can get together virtually in this time of COVID. And we wish everyone uh, to stay healthy and stay safe. So thank you very much.